Hi, this is Dr. John Bergsma from the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology and Franciscan University of Steubenville. And today we're talking about the readings for Friday of the 18th week of Ordinary Time. Let's jump right in. As you know, during this time in Ordinary Time, uh, we are reading through the prophets in the first reading. We're getting a big taste of the prophets, and we've come up to the prophet Nahum, or Nahum. Nahum is one of the 12 minor prophets, and indeed, Nahum is one of the minorest of the minor prophets. It's uh, one of the shortest uh, of uh, the books of the Bible. Um, Obadiah is uh, shorter yet, but it's, it's uh, one of the challengers for shortest, uh, at least Old Testament biblical book. And, um, and Nahum is very focused. There's not a lot to Nahum. Basically, the book is one long oracle of judgment against the nation of Assyria. Okay. Now, maybe you don't know too much about Assyria other than having heard the name of the nation uh, from Old Testament readings uh, occasionally, but let's give a little bit of background here. Uh, Assyria was the international world power uh, in the 900s and the 800s and into uh, even the 700s uh, BC. And uh, during that time, Assyria uh, grew to great dominance and basically uh, controlled the known civilized world for much of that time period. And during that time, Assyria was constantly a threat to the existence of Israel and Judah, which had broken up into different kingdoms in the late 900s after the reign of Solomon. And eventually in 722 BC, in fact, Assyria swept in from the north and utterly destroyed the northern kingdom what we sometimes call the Northern Ten Tribes, and they were wiped out and taken into uh, exile. And that was a, a huge disaster, a terrible thing, because it, it seemed like all God's great promises to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob to bless the world through their descendants uh, was derailed by the Assyrians destroying the people of Israel. Of course, uh, that didn't happen because there were still a few tribes left to the south, and through them would come the Messiah, etc. But it was disastrous in 722 BC when Assyria destroyed Israel. Well, our reading from Nahum today says, See upon the mountains their advances, the bearer of good news, announcing peace. Celebrate your feasts, O Judah. Fulfill your vows, for nevermore shall you be invaded by the scoundrel. He is completely destroyed. The Lord will, dis will restore the vine of Jacob, the pride of Israel. Though ravagers have ravaged them and ruined the tendrils, woe to the bloody, bloody city, all lies, full of plunder whose looting never stops. Um, going to drop down to the end. Nineveh is destroyed. Who can pity her? Where can one find any to console her? So Nahum is basically prophesying restoration to the people of Judah and destruction to the city of Nineveh. What would eventually happen is, uh, Nineveh, by the way, was the capital of Assyria, not to be confused with Syria, which is a very different country whose capital is Damascus. Uh, they're even etymo etymologically different. Uh, Assyria comes from an ancient word, Ashur, uh, which is not related to uh, the root that gives us the modern country of Syria, which in ancient times is actually called Aram but uh, not to get confused with all that for the moment. But anyway, Nineveh was the capital of this evil empire, Assyria. And after Assyria had wiped out the northern ten tribes, they came after the southern kingdom of Judah, also called the kingdom of David. And the great king Hezekiah faced them down to a stalemate around the year 700 BC. And they were not able to capture the city of Jerusalem. They had to withdraw. And that was the high water mark for the empire of Assyria. And they began to decline rapidly after that, when they, after they had failed to take the kingdom of Judah. And uh, shortly after, the emperor was assassinated. And then things began to fall apart. And a coalition of uh, 
ancient nations headed up by Babylon eventually defeated the Assyrians and wiped them out, and they were no longer in existence. But the kingdom of Judah survived. So what do we get out of our first reading? Well, Assyria is a type of all the nations and powers and organizations and empires that have set themselves up against God's people through the ages. And at any given time, they seem absolutely colossal and undefeatable. I mean, there was a time in my life where I thought Moscow was going to take over the world and and was unstoppable. And in my father's generation, there was a time when it seemed like Berlin was an unstoppable force that was going to un- overtake the whole world in his childhood. And in previous centuries, there were other evil empires. Uh, the Vikings during the medieval period seemed like they were going to wipe Christian civilization from the face of the earth. St. Augustine died with with the barbarian hordes around the city of Carthage, wiping out Roman Christian civilization from the face of the earth. The, um, The Ottoman Turks, the Muslim Turks in Istanbul for centuries looked like an unstoppable force that was gonna wipe the church from the face of the earth. So uh, these are all types of Assyria. And the message of the first reading is, these evil empires will not last, but the kingdom of God's people will. Let's go down to our gospel reading now. Matthew 16, uh, verses 24 through 28. Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wishes to come after me must deny himself, take up his cross, And follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What profit would there be for one to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? I would prefer the translation his soul, because what we're talking about here is not natural life, but eternal life. Or what can one give in exchange for his life, that is, his soul? For the Son of Man will come with his angels in his Father's glory, and then he will repay each according to his conduct. Amen, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Amen. Okay, so I love this reading because I'm a convert from Protestantism, and I grew up giving lip service to this principle that one is saved by faith alone and that one's works do not matter towards salvation. Well, I ask you, when Jesus says, whoever wishes to come after me must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me, does that sound that like Jesus is saying all you have to do is believe and your lifestyle doesn't need to change and you can still be saved? I would suggest to you that it does not, okay? I think that this is... Uh, one of the most powerful teachings of our Lord that seems like a direct contradiction, not seems like, it is a direct uh, contradiction of the way that salvation by faith alone is understood by a great many Americans and others in the world, okay? We are not saved simply by believing. Um, Faith is huge. Faith opens us up to God's grace, but then we need to receive God's grace and accept God's grace and cooperate with God's grace in our life, and our lives need to be transformed. Okay, so the Christian life is one of carrying the cross. (coughs) That is to say, accepting and embracing hardship and suffering (coughs) in communion with Jesus, with Jesus. Uh, The cross is the way of salvation, okay? We, in a sense, we are saved by imitating Christ in the embrace of suffering, persecution, evil, hardship, challenges, however you want to phrase it, and by embracing them with love, as Jesus did in his life, we become united to Jesus, conform to Jesus, and we share in his triumph because we've shared in his suffering, as Romans 8 says, okay? We will share in his glory if we share in his suffering. That's St. Paul in Romans chapter 8. Okay, so um, we need to stop chasing the American dream and living the rat race, etc., and trying to have comfort, possessions, uh, etc., in this life. That is foolish. What, what does that profit? 
even if we were to gain the whole world and in the process lose our soul, Jesus says, what gain is that? We have to think from an eternal perspective, give up these natural riches, comforts, etc., in order to gain eternal life. Because when the Son of Man comes, he will repay each according to his conduct, not each according to what he believed or what he assigned his name to a set of doctrines or something, but according to his conduct. You see, this is another teaching of Christ that contradicts this idea of salvation by faith alone as it is understood by so many. Okay? Uh, Our conduct is what we are going to be uh, judged on according to Christ himself. So let us seek the grace that is the God's power in the sacraments so that we can be uh, transformed so that um, we will not taste the real death until we see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. What does Jesus mean with some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom? Well, in one sense, not taste the real death, which is the death of the soul. Okay, we'll never experience the death of the soul until they see the Son of Man at the final judgment. That's in one sense. In another sense, there's some who would not taste natural death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom because the transfiguration, which we read yesterday, okay, but which is actually the next chapter from today's gospel reading, the transfiguration was a foretaste of the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And it's no accident that this chapter of Matthew is right before the transfiguration because Peter, James, and John did not taste even physical death before they had this foretaste of the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Well, that's some things to meditate about today. Let's uh, give up the chase for worldly riches in order to embrace the cross and share in the eternal life that Christ will give us and actually has given us already, beginning with our baptism. And uh, we will experience it with him forever. That is worth far more than anything we could gain in this uh, temporal existence that we are in right now. So this has been Dr. John Bergser from the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology and Franciscan University of Steubenville. And we've been talking about the readings for the 18th week of Ordinary Time Friday. Till next time, God bless you.